Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Linda Gregerson in support of Canopy this evening. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open as I'll be sharing links to purchase Canopy from Literati throughout the event. Uh, the Q&A is also available to you this evening. We encourage you to use that Q&A to submit any questions you might have. Uh, we'll ask a few of those questions on your behalf at the conclusion of the reading. And live transcription is available to you as well using the CC icon on your toolbar. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also like and subscribe to be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events when they become available on our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. Without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's reader. Linda Gregerson is the author of six previous collections of poetry, most recently Prodigal, New and Selected Poems. A former chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, Gregerson is the Carolyn Walker Bynum Distinguished University Professor at the University of Michigan, where she directs the Helen Zell Writers Program. Please join me in welcoming Linda Gregerson into your living rooms. Thank you, John. And I have to say, I especially appreciate that the background you chose for these events is the poetry section at Literati. Um, thank you everyone um, who's been able to join us this evening. Um, and for those of you who may be joining later on. Um, I'm just going to begin. Love poem. Once, my very best darling. The sea and the land were all one mass. And the light was confused and hadn't found a place to rest. And Emma, love. My sister's eyes were not yet there to hold it all together since she hadn't yet been born. And I imagine, though I never thought to ask them, I believe they must have been afraid. My own poor bit at being born so nearly having killed her, not my sister, no, our mother. Though I see, looking into your own two eyes, that one is a matter of course, entails the other. And I don't even think I can properly call it love, what I demanded, what I had in mind. I wanted something mine, and what you wish for, if the gods see fit to grant it, marks the limits of your soul. And though the years have scoured the worst of what made me unfit for the gift, and even then, when you were new, improved the odds, if all I could think with you in my arms was taste of bile, the thousand ways of harming you, lest the world should do it for me, what's to become of me now she's gone? My sister, love, my one, and longed for only. You said, because it has fallen on you to be my comfort at your daily job, you said, there's been science. The people in labs have done brain scans and the thing we take for this I am about to do is really just the flash of the neurons in fear which has evolved to keep us safe. I didn't keep her safe. I left her to the daily harms. I might have seen them coming, some of them, one of the worst in any case. And then, but that was different than the illness that had only left me bitten, took her altogether in its jaws. I thought sometimes that she had turned away from me. I am frightened for you till you do. This next poem is in five sections. Um, they're each 
they're rather separate. So it's not a single scene, for example, or a single time frame. Um, the, is there's a reference, I don't know if this extends beyond central Wisconsin, but the, um, the resale shop called, uh, run by St. Vincent de Paul Charities um, is referred to at least <laughs> um, in Newport County as St. Vinnie's. Uh, and um, there's a section that refers to a novel I love, and some of you will recognize it as um, Michael Ondaatje's The English Patient. Saint Sorry. One. Because she had no money, and because they called it a charity shop. The woman whose 10 week old baby had finally died, though of what and why it couldn't be fixed, she'd never be able to understand. She asked them there, the people at the charity shop, would they give her a dress to wear for the service? She only had jeans. And because they told her no, my mother for years would quietly bring our secondhand clothes the 20 odd miles to Portage where if people were not kinder in the aggregate, they hadn't yet flouted the basic laws of human. St. Vinnie's down the road she never talked about. Why add to the shame? Which means her trips to Portage were to our minds just another of my mother's minor oddnesses. I don't recall who finally told me the story or how long she had been dead by then. Two, Saint after the fact. Saint, sorry, I must have slept through the part that mattered. And the time I wouldn't eat it, food she'd cooked because I'd asked for it. And every callow rudeness to a check-in clerk, check-out clerk, I made her watch, like smearing mud on linen. If these are the screens, imagine the things I did that I won't talk about. That grocery cart, abandoned in the parking lot. When you see me pushing it back to the store, think penance in a faithless age. Three, it's not so much the terror when the world as they know it is broken in two. Two-year-olds, six-year-olds, snatched at the border and carted off to God knows where. It's what dawns on them later. This isn't some terrible rupture in the way the world is meant to work. It's the way it has always been. You can see it in their faces and will always be. Their eyes go flat. So that's when I had my money shot. I filed the JPEG, went back to our dreary motel, plaid carpets, and ordered a double scotch. Camera in the bottom of my shoulder bag, plaid for the dark. Four, in the novel I love, years later, when the killing has not stopped, but only shifted to other fronts, the girl who of course is no longer a girl and knows as once she had only surmised how much of the wreckage is beyond repair, the girl who is older now and for a moment distracted, turns and with her shoulder dislodges a glass that falls as glasses do to the floor, but just before the floor, on the other side of the globe, the boy, who of course is no longer a boy and yet endowed with the grace it takes a boy to catch a fallen object, say a shiny piece of cutlery 
while it's still in the air, extends his arm and does. But of paradise, wrote Mandeville, I cannot properly speak. For in all my travels, I was not there. I don't know how many of you have um, taken the time to watch. I think there were seven seasons, all extraordinary seven seasons of the German um, uh, made for television uh, series uh, called Babylon Berlin. It's present tense, it's set um, between the two world wars that we have so far had. And, um, but there are flashbacks uh, to World War I. And a, a little, a small clip from one of these flashbacks uh, really came to haunt me. And that's what this um, poem is about. It's called, Horse in a gas mask. It hadn't occurred to me that horses in World War I, of course, were working precisely in the areas where they were being um, gassed. They discovered that they could keep the horses alive if they wore gas masks, but they couldn't keep them in all instances from going blind because they couldn't use the goggles um, that they use on humans. Uh, they fogged up too much and the horses got panicky. Horse in a gas mask, brow bend, cheek piece, throat latch, bit, plus all the links and leathers for holding this extra part on. We're meant to be accustomed to the bodies in the mud. We've seen the documentaries. We've read about the mustard gas. We know they're only actors on a union wage. What is it about the horse that falls, is that the way to put it, that falls just slightly out of solution here? Precipitate, noun that fails to hold its peace within the fiction. There will have been a handler on the set. There were rules. The barbed wire won't have torn his flank. You can train a horse to stagger, maybe. Check the delicate ankles later on. But this ghastly reproduction of a ghastly piece of now you're allowed to breathe again. It isn't so wholly removed from the world as in a better world would be the case. You've seen the newsreels, everything black and white back then. The one man's hand on the first man's shoulder, next man's hand on his, and then the whole retreating line of them gassed bandages over their eyes. It seems the horses could go blind as well. No help for it. Something about the goggles and their fogging up. So in this latter day story by means of moving pictures, one part punctures the set to music consolations of its all reenactment with a proper arc. Candle, pommel, stirrup, girth, all suited to our purposes. Camera, liquid eye. Our university here in Ann Arbor is blessed with an extraordinary library system and extraordinary, gifted, learned, um, generous 
<laughs> librarians. Um, I went to some talks of several years ago about um, uh, with a number of the librarians talking about some um, curation and some of the challenges in um, the 21st century uh, when what we want to um, archive, what we want to be able to access ourselves later on and what we want future humanity to be able to access um, belongs to realms of technology that are quite ephemeral. This poem is called Archival. If the curator should wish, for example, to save for later scrutiny or wonder, wonders worthy too, a once ubiquitous download for dispersing the forces of Christendom, for evading the enemy's landmines, for colonizing Mars, and if, as is all but certain, the program depends on software run by hardware no longer extant. If reconstructions work too well, eliding the awkward temporal gap between keystroke and pixelated body count, how will they know what it's like to be us? If even the ditches along our abandoned railroad spur has long succumbed to never any water, how will they know what we mean by July, when the cornflowers first appear, when gladly the parched eye quenches its thirst in blue? For providence, in lieu of the kind we used to think we trusted in, we built a global seed vault on an island in the Arctic Sea. There are rules. The seeds aren't owned, but stored, and only the donors of origin have access. That will tell them something too. So maize and eggplant, lotus root, and cabbage in potentia for the world to come, assuming survival of people who remember what the seeds are for and something that passes for topsoil. Permafrost, 500 meters at present and sleeping tectonics below, sites well above what's likely to be a flood zone when the ice caps melt. It must have helped with costs a bit to build the vault where once we mined for coal. They'll credit us with irony. There are many things we will be credited with and blamed for um, in the future. Um, irony is probably too generous an assessment. Um, it's been a long two and a half years. Many of us um, have suffered terribly and lost dear ones. Others of us, the very, very fortunate, still have gotten lonely. Um, it's, it's been very isolating. There were, in the first year of the pandemic, a number of wonderfully um, generous and ambitious editors who put together some anthologies of poems uh, written um, in response to the pandemic. And, um, this is one I was um, asked to write and, uh, and submit to one of those anthologies. It's, um, <laughs> it's set here in, in Michigan. Um, and some of you will recognize um, some of the bits of it. Um, it's called, If the Cure for AIDS. And that title is uh, also the first line of the poem. If the cure for AIDS, said someone in that earlier pandemic, were a glass of clean water, we couldn't save half the people here. If half the workers at Tyson Meats come down with the virus, we still have a plan 
for protecting the owners from lawsuits. If the phone in the farmhouse rings when it's long past dark and the milk, if the tanks at the co-op are full, if milk dumped into a culvert makes you think of death. My neighbor drove to Lansing in his pickup. I expect you've seen the photos too. The state house floor, the rifles. He had just culled half his herd. And while we're casting about for ways to summon normal, I've been watching footage of the day old chicks. The 116,000 buried alive. It seems we can't afford the feed or can't afford the falling price of chicken. I'm mostly confused by the articles meant to explain. Look at the spill of them. Dump truck into the pre-dug ditch. The mewling yellow spill of them still in the down we find adorable. Redder, impassive skyscape. Skittering bits of agitation on the body of the whole. The poem um, with which I will end is in three sections. Um, it uh, is the poem from which the title of the book derives. Um, it is not called Canopy, it's called something else, but um, Canopy features here. As, and, and that Canopy um, uh, came to my attention, uh, newly to my attention, because of a wonderful, Thing my elder daughter told me. She and her dog, Toby, um, have trained and are um, uh, activated. They're, 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 they're called into service for something called um, wilderness air search and rescue, uh, which is when dog, dog human teams um, go in search of missing persons whom they hope still to find alive. Um, wilderness airborne search and rescue. Okay. And um, that, that wilderness can be misleading. It might be um, something we think of as might be marshes. It might be um, woods. It might be um, landscape with it that's difficult to make one's way through, but it also might be an abandoned factory or an abandoned industrial site. So it's, um, it's simply a place um, and often one of very large scale so that there have to be um, support teams on the ground as well, um, uh, doing the uh, mapping out the quadrants. When they were training one time near a body of water um, and, and it's usually, alas, when someone has drowned, um, my daughter was told by somebody who was more experienced than she um, about one contingency that dog, dog humans needed to be aware of, which is if the dogs um, have searched everywhere along a water, um, uh, running water, have not indicated uh, at, at any point there, have not located anything in the underbrush or the trees or spotted anything that can be seen on the other side of the river, um, but do um, focus obsessively on the upper canopy in the trees and really go through all their signs of indicating, usually that's a certain kind of barking. Um, that one possibility is precisely that there is a body not visible, but a body on the other side of the river that um, has uh, who sent the scent from which has 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 moved along the earth, been joined in the water, uh, assimilated into it, and then 
um, drunk by the roots of the trees nearby and drawn up uh, and then expired um, through the leaves. And the dogs stunningly are able to identify uh, a human scent, um, having gone through that many transformations. When nothing but tree, when nothing but tree can be seen in the tree, though the dogs unmistakably indicate. When clearly the canopy calls to them and days have passed before you've even begun. When nothing in the undergrowth has prompted so much as a whimper, you must turn your thoughts to the other bank Scent from a living body will be carried on the wind. Scent from a corpse in the river spreads like oil. But say the return to elements has started just beyond that rise. The body is cold. The scent, like a river, seeks lowest ground, becoming part of the river itself, which the trees in turn, imbibe, and a drawing upward change to living green. The one you seek is now an exhalation, which the dogs, intelligent beyond our wildest reckoning, have told us, have been telling us, In Basel, on a panel made of lime wood, emphatically unrisen, the body of Christ lies in its frame as in a coffin, thwarted verticals. And strung along a fault line where the pigment in egg yolk old way meets the pigment in linseed new, the flesh breathes beauty as only that which is liable to perish can breathe. The green going black of face, of feet, a visible hand confirm no going back to what you were. How is it the linen on which he lies so clearly discloses a palette of stone, and hence the catalog title, Entombed, which means the coffin I've imagined, warmer framework, must be pity's crafted afterthought or argument. The holy this world begging to differ with all we've been taught to hope for. 1521, the heretic from Wittenberg refuses to recant, though the question has not yet turned to presence or real. Sit down at my table, my body, my blood, and I, on your behalf, will paint a picture. Note the gaping nostril, gaping mouth the other mouth of the wound in his side, the cradle of the abdomen. You see how disproportionate I've made his length, the better to seal credulity. It's 1521. It is known, writes my informant, that the artist used a body retrieved from the brine. Citation needed. And either the fish had not eaten the open eye or Holbein in his studio restored it. Never elsewhere, says the lime wood. Never blind. Behold the nearer case for mystery. I'm here to praise. Thank you. And that's where I'll stop and if there are 
any questions, um, I'd be delighted to take them. John's gonna um, referee if there is yes. anything to be found in the Q&A. And I, I'm sending the applause of all of our attendees and my <laughs> modest applause. Um, thank you, Linda. We do have some questions. Great. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, Elizabeth writes, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about the themes or preoccupations around which the whole book coalesced for you over time, if that's how it worked? <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, well, I thought, um, I, I, I read very slowly, so you know, books take a while. I thought um, that more of that, that this book was going to be chiefly a book of the, those mixed sort of love poems and elegies. Um, the, the one I read is one of a pair to my daughters. There are some other, I mean, I, I hadn't, um, I had finished my previous book before my sister's death and um, hadn't quite um, managed to write about it. But uh, the world of course happens and is larger than even um, what felt to me like a very, very large personal grief. And so inevitably um, the other kinds of things happening in the world um, entered the poem, um, including some of the um, cruelties perpetuated by our um, both domestic and, and foreign policies, um, cruelties for which we are very much accountable. Um, it, it did seem, uh, and when my, my editor first looked at this book, she, she noted that there were actually, there was a nature thread. Um, and I think um, it, there is, there is definitely. And maybe it's because uh, two things, one, um, there, nature, alas, and the um, harm we are perpetrating upon it is yet another cause for the elegiac and the remorseful in writing. Um, but also because I think it um, gives, it, it, it's very helpful to me to, to be reminded again and again of how um, <laughs> um, small my self and my concerns and being in the world are compared to all other measures. And uh, it's something I am moved to celebrate. I, I, I do think of this as a book of praise. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, go between uh, that question and our next question with, with my own question, because uh, I feel it maybe follows on that. Uh, um, Readers of your work were probably familiar with your your work for a long time in this tercet form, um, which you uh, wrote that um, became something of a generative proposition, not just a kind of packaging delineation produced the poem. And I was struck by the first poem you read, Love Poem, um, uh, by uh, seeing it on the page uh, and hearing it, hearing you read it. Um, on the page, it's sort of arranged in these couplets, and yeah. um, uh, and hearing you read it, it is like w walking into someone's mind uh, as they're thinking, or or uh, a speech act, a monologue maybe to someone or nobody. Um, and I not have not resolved what I think about the relationship and the interplay between hearing you read the poem and the lineation, which is sort of an endlessly fascinating thing about hearing poets read their work. But I'm curious for you, you know, if the tercet form was this thing that produced the poem, how are you finding form <laughs> in your work now? Um, right. What is that relationship like in, in, in the seventh collection? Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, I, I wrote two books exclusively in that tercet form. And, and, and um, I really thought I could not write any other way. And then I realized I had to, and um, but I but I was I was very anxious about it. I really didn't know what to do next because I'd relied on it so much. But then I had come to make it a crutch, and so I really really had to change. I still I will say that the the way I write now 
has in common with that tercet form, and which I ret return to sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, two things. One is its relationship with to the poem on the voice, the poem as I hear it, the poem as I read it, when I read aloud, which is to say it's neither the tercet nor these other things, I'm the couplets or other things I happen to do. Sometimes it's a wandering line. Um, they're, they're not transcriptions in the sense that they don't, you know, line and endings don't mark a, a pause, a, 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 an audible pause or anything like that. But in their general um, speeding up and slowing down and the line breaks that are recurrently in jammed, I mean, I tend to favor an in jammed line, they um, are meant to suggest something about the um, uneven pacing of mm -hmm. the poem as it's, as I hear it and as I hope my readers will hear it. And it was very kind of you to say that thing about entering a mind, since that's of course the effect I'm very, very much hoping to, to produce. The other thing is that I still, whether I'm working in that tercet or in another one of these um, formats, and sometimes it's just a fairly simple couplet, this one happens to have some indents in it, um, or, or something a little more elaborate. I, I still rely on that stanza pattern to tell me how to write the poem. So yeah. it is, I start um, in, the early, in all the early phases, I have to map out, um, I try out different kinds of patterns mm -hmm. for the stanza and see <laughs> which one will sail. <laughs> yeah. and, and then, but then, but, but that has to be set very, very early, the first six or eight lines. I, I really can't write, further into the poem without that. And then mm. I, 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 it really does teach me um, things, I guess, because I don't want, I, I, I do want some turns of mind to occur. Um, and, and I want some variation in pacing of the thought, not just of the way, you know, the syntax or something goes. So, so in, in many ways, I've, I've still got a fairly consistent method. And so that form that you're choosing, or that is sort of choosing itself, is then informing recomposition or, or revision in that way? It, it's informing the composition. I mean, I, I revise okay, okay. extravagantly, but mm -hmm. as I'm writing, that mm -hmm, is, yeah. I might revise the first 11 lines endlessly before right. I go on to the next right. three or four. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds larger familiar. Ones, <laughs> larger <laughs> revisions. You know, once I've got the thing down on paper, they're really, they're really tough for me because I, I, um, because, because I don't know how to build back in. Right. Yeah. Uh, discovery. Yeah. Authentic discovery. That's cool. Thank you for that. That's, those are all really fascinating insights to your work. I, I appreciate that greatly. Um, Henry writes, thank you, Linda, for these beautiful poems. The pandemic has been horrible nothing redeeming about it. And yet I wonder, has it led to any change in your creative process that may have in some sense altered your work? I didn't catch the last sentence. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and yet I wonder, uh, has the pandemic led to any change in your creative process that may have in some sense altered your work? Thank you for that. Um, I did have a period because of the pandemic um, of being at home with more time and, um, and over a, a, a couple of summers actually, but in particular that first summer. Um, and I took to riding my bicycle a lot. <laughs> and I actually worked on the poems when I'm, again, I write very, very, very slowly. So I might have a few lines. And then I have a sort of, well, I have a three and a half mile circuit and I have a five and a half mile circuit and I have a seven mile circuit um, on, uh, on, on whichever I was doing that day. I would, I would tend to go over the poem in my, in my head and see, and especially when I hit one of those places where I thought, okay, 
you've used up this arc of thought or this image and and every other place I thought to go when I was sitting at my desk was too predictable. I mean, I tried, you know, 27 wrong places. And sometimes it would really be that bicycle ride that would help. For example, in archival, the cornflowers came directly from that. Um, the cornflowers in the ditch came directly from that bicycle ride. So, and that was new for me because I'm not, some people compose all the time when they're walking and so forth. That's not, uh, somehow the bicycle works better for me. <laughs> um, I think we have two more questions uh, to get to here. Um, Patricia, um, sort of circling back to composition, uh, writes, I love how your poems are not linear, but when you begin a poem, uh, what is the process for knowing, understanding, selecting what a subsequent section will be? Do you have to wait a while till you know the next? So going back to how you mentioned, you know, the revision is happening with the form in the process of writing and not sort of like putting it in the desk, coming back, rearranging things. I, I, I imagine this question is asking similarly with, with, with sectioning poems. As well. Right, all those sections, um, there is an arc to writing a section. Sometimes I imagine um, that, yay, I've written a shorter poem. It's always been nice, um, you know, um, and, and, and then too often find, yeah, I don't think so. It's just, that's not enough, Linda. Um, it's just, you know, you have it. And, and then I don't know where to go. And that, that, that can take a long time. It's not a happy period of waiting, I should say. It's a very angst-making um, sort of, I guess it's, the, if, if angst is a form of activity, it's an active kind of waiting. Um, and it's usually because I, I want, I want to deepen from my, I want me to have to think more deeply about something I've just done. And that means um, going someplace maybe intuitively that doesn't seem, well, it shouldn't seem to have an obvious analog. Otherwise, it's just going to be another predictable and it will be moralizing or something equally dreadful. <laughs> so, so sometimes just an intuitive spark, but then my job is to find out where the two, the section that's written and the section I'm moving into, where they're going to speak to one another. So thank you. And, and that, I find that is the most fascinating. It's often the most hard, it's often the hardest, but the most yeah. worthwhile part of writing. Hmm. Um, I think we have time for, for one more question. I think it's a good question to end on. Uh, Brahma writes, thank you, Linda, for these poems. During the pandemic, there's been tremendous focus on science and medicine. What role does art play during these times for the artists themselves and their audience? Have we undervalued the role of art as therapy for isolation and healing during this time? How can we, what can we do to better high, better in highlighting uh, the role of poetry during times of crisis? Thank you for that. Um, and because I have a notion that actually um, practice of scientific research um, and the practice of poetic making are, are, um, are actually secret um, sister endeavors. <laughs> um, but, but I think many, many people turn, interestingly, to poetry, um, certainly to, to art, um, both making art and, um, I hate to use the word consuming, but turning to, you know, um, turning to art made by others um, uh, or art that, that may have been made by others a very, very long time ago for some form of, of yes, I think to assuage um, the terror of loneliness, to, um, to find some foothold in meaning making because so much more has been out of our control um, during this pandemic than many of us in privileged 
circumstances um, with heated homes and enough food to eat and jobs that continue. Um, enough of us have had, we've been really destabilized by that loss of, it's just a higher proportion of loss of control than, than has normally been the case. And there, there is enormous um, sustenance. I don't even want to say consolation and, or, or, or therapy. There's, sus there's food for us in the process of making meaning and trying to touch those sites where other human beings have suffered or felt joy and made meaning. Um, there, the readership in poetry went wildly up. In fact, it has actually gone wild, even started going way up before the pandemic. And I only know that because when I was um, attending chancellor's board meetings uh, at, at, uh, for um, the academy, um, that we would get these stunning statistics every year about, and, and, and I think, so I think it's not just the pandemic. I actually think it's also the, you know, the profound um, dissonance in our culture, the, the dispersals, the uh, angers that we are searching for some touchstones and some links with other human beings who may not seem to be like us, but in fact, our sharers. So I certainly think art's important all the time, but yeah, I think it, I think it, get, it becomes heightened in importance when humans are troubled. Yeah. And certainly there's been alienation that, that predated the pandemic as well. So that yeah. kind of reaching out is, yeah. is there in the poems. Um, that's amazing. That's very exciting to hear those stats. I would it, it explain why our poetry section also grew by two cases over nine oh, years. Right. So, <laughs> that's the way um, we want to go. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, Linda, thank you so much for, for joining us and launching your book here with us at, at Homeless Literati. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. Folks can purchase Canopy and hardcover paperback at the links that I've shared in the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, there's links in the description below me. Um, hope to have you back in the store for a reading in the not too distant future. But until then, I hope you continue to be well. And to all of our viewers, uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care, all. Have a great night. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody.